Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another stream here on our American Family Insurance Dream Bank page. I'm Madeline, and I'm a dream curator, curator here at Dream Bank. Today, I have the honor of introducing you to Kira Wackett. Kira lives in Portland, Oregon with her husband and daughter. She runs two companies, Advert Adversity Rising and Kind of Creative. During the day, she is a therapist who specializes in eating disorders, anxiety disorders, and trauma. She, she received her master's degree in counseling psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. One thing Kira loves is peppermint mocha coffee creamers. Take it away, Kira. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's slightly weird because I am presenting and I'm staring at slides, which the next slide is a picture of my face. So I'm staring at my face, not moving and can't see all of you. So I'm imagining all of your faces and wonder out in the world. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about what has always been a really important topic. And especially right now with the world and everything that we've been going through, I think is increasingly more imperative for us to talk about and do some work in. So our goal today is to really start to broach the topic on what forgiveness is and how we can make that something that is attainable in our lives and really to better understand exactly why it's important. Obviously, in a 30-minute discussion, we're not going to be able to hit on everything. And so I'm going to be sharing some resources with you at the end if you want to go deeper in this topic. And obviously, if there are specific things that you want or need to know, please use the chat and use put comments in at any point. If there are things that are coming up, we'll make sure that we address them at the end, or we'll at least give you some answers on where to go to get those answers at the end. Okay, so a little bit more about me. I think that they did a great job introducing me already, just I guess a bit more. Basically, as a therapist, as a speaker, as a facilitator, my job is to work with people on communication, shame, and fear, and really helping people write the story of the life that they want to lead. And so forgiveness is a big part of that, because as we're going to talk about throughout this presentation, Forgiveness is really about untethering ourselves from our past and moving out of painful experiences so that we can learn from, make sense of, integrate them into our story, but not have them be the guiding narrator of the story that we continue to live. I also think that it's really important to point out that as we talk about these topics, something that's really important to me is to be as inclusive as possible. Again, that's something that really is about being aware of everybody's intersecting identities, of how culture, of how the context of our environment really shows up, we won't be able to address all the specifics and nuances of that. So if there are really specific questions that you have for me around this or how this might apply in different settings, please feel free to email me and I'll make sure I share that with you at the end. And Maddie, you can also go ahead and put that in the comments if you'd like as well for people. Okay, so as we get started, I want to start by first just making clear what is it that we're talking about when we talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness is defined as a conscious or deliberate decision. It's something that's made of our own volition. It's really designed to be a personal choice and something that we have the freedom and right to choose with the goal being to untether. So if any of you remember playing tetherball as a kid with that pole and a string and a ball tied on the end. To untether basically means take the ball off the pole. So to detach ourselves from negative or what's typically referred to as negative emotions, sensations, feelings, beliefs, that might be anger, frustration, sadness, depression, revenge. And the goal here is to do it because we are freeing ourselves from the pain, not because we feel that we have to, not because someone has asked for it, and not even if we feel like someone deserves it. So I'm just going to summarize that again, because that's a lot I just threw at you. Forgiveness is the letting go or freeing ourselves up from the painful experiences, wrongdoings, and people in our life so that we can live our best lives and we are not tethered to that pain, but can move forward. So when I think about forgiveness as it stands right now, part of the reason I think it's difficult, especially when I work with clients and patients is kind of two main reasons. One, forgiveness in terms of how it's introduced to us, especially when we were kids. So I'm a new mom, I've been a mom for, 10 and a half months, I think. So I'm very aware there's a lot I'm still learning. 
but I become increasingly aware of how we talk about and how we introduce things. And one, I can't remember when this was, a few months ago, I was revisiting some shows from back when I was a kid and I was watching some of the Full House episodes and found myself getting incredibly annoyed at the conflict avoidance and the sort of overvaluing of harmony that happens in the show, which basically reinforces just kind of moving past things rather than actually dealing with them. So there's, if any of you have watched the show, it's kind of this like, hug it out, say, I'm sorry, hug, everything's fine, move forward. And that's how we introduce forgiveness. Someone says, I'm sorry, you're expected to forgive them, move on. But what that does is that overvalues harmony, meaning making everybody else not be uncomfortable. We're just going to make sure everyone feels good. We smooth it out, take the wrinkles out, move forward, rather than actually giving permission to the person who's been wronged or who has experienced wrongdoing to feel their feelings fully and then feel empowered to make a choice to let them go and move forward. And then the second thing I think is an issue is what we're going to talk about in the next few slides. And that's some of the myths and perpetuations of forgiveness. So essentially, now we talked about what is forgiveness. It's a deliberate decision, meaning something we are choosing that frees us up from painful experiences because we want to live a life that is empowering and allows us to succeed and feel Kira, you muted yourself. <laughs> so we were talking about this for anybody that knows, I have no idea why my computer has muted itself a couple of times because when I'm sharing my screen, it should be, I'm not even touching anything, but we're gonna just see what happens. Mm -hmm. So keeping going, Maddie, interrupt me if that happens again, let me know. With forgiveness right now, a lot of times what people say is, it's like saying it never happened, means I'd be sweeping things under the rug or letting people off the hook. But what that is, is people equating forgiveness with the justice process. And in fact, justice is its own moral virtue and they happen completely independent. So for example, if I lie to somebody, if I hurt someone's feelings, if I am unfaithful in a relationship in some way, shape or form, the other party can forgive me, can move forward from what has happened. They can live their life. They can let go of that emotional intensity. And the justice might be that the relationship has still ended. Maybe the friendships are done. Maybe we move forward and the way that the relationship is has changed and that's the justice part then there's obviously legal justice and other aspects as well but the important piece to remember is that forgiveness is not about saying well i can't because then it means that nothing happened it's saying something happened and i'm going to move past that to continue to live my life the second thing is that forgiveness does not require you to talk to your wrongdoer Obviously, this is a little bit interesting when we talk about forgiveness in the context of self-forgiveness, because if you are also the wrongdoer, you're kind of in your head all the time. But a lot of times what happens is people think that they're going to have to engage with someone or have a confrontation, and that can make people feel unsafe, that can make them feel overwhelmed, that can make them feel as though there's a threat to their life or that the interaction might be just too intense for them. They can also feel like if you have to go back and engage with somebody, that we are reopening a wound and causing deeper pain. So forgiveness, again, is about your own process. It does not require you to actually ever engage with the wrongdoer. It's about your decision to move forward from what has happened. And again, sometimes from that person as a whole. And then in the terms of it's going to make pain deeper, I think where the issue here is, is we often believe, well, we're going to have such intense pain and we're never going to be able to get past that. There's a period of time where we probably will feel a bit more pain if we sit with something that's really difficult. And forgiveness is actually correlated with a reduction in a lot of negative emotions and experiences, which we'll talk about in a few slides. And then lastly, forgiveness is not about giving your power away. So this, I think, kind of comes in from the justice standpoint, but also feelings of revenge and feelings of needing to have the upper hand. Sometimes we feel like if we forgive, we lose our power in an interaction. But in reality, forgiveness is about taking our power back because we're living our life the way that we want to, not in relation to somebody else and what has happened in our past. 
So as anyone is commenting, putting things in the chat, I'm just gonna pause. Maddie, are there any questions coming up we need to address about all of this before I go forward? No questions this far. Okay. People saying hello. Okay, awesome. Well, hi to everybody. I'm glad that you're here. I will pause again in a little bit to check in. So if you have things that aren't settling in as we keep going, definitely make sure that you comment and we can make sure we address that. So I wanna talk a little bit about then how we break down and understand forgiveness. So forgiveness involves two processes. It involves a grieving process and then a healing process. So grieving is incredibly important because that's that piece where I said empowering people to feel their feelings. When something happens, we have to take the time to grieve what's been lost. What that sense of violation, the elements of pain that we've experienced, we have to be empowered to feel all those things fully. And if we stay stuck in the grieving process and don't move towards healing, what ends up happening is we just keep the wound open. We never allow it to heal. So then as new wrongdoings or experiences happen, instead of them being their own separated incidences, it just becomes one major big wound. And that can start to fester, which I know sounds gross, but really in that grossness means it gets worse. It just starts to build on itself. And that's where we get sort of chronic resentment, anger, sadness, shame that feels even more difficult to deal with. So by grieving fully that experience and that wrongdoing and then moving into healing, it's like cleaning out a wound and then giving it the space so that it can heal. And if a new wound happens, then we deal with that wound in and of itself. The other thing that's important here is that in the healing process, what we're doing is we're actually saying that those feelings matter and those feelings, those experiences can be transient, meaning short lived, whatever that means kind of subjectively. Sometimes that can be six months, sometimes that's years. But then the healing process comes where we can get distance from that and again, feel a sense of peace. So there are a few types of forgiveness. So one of the main types is forgiveness of others, which for the purposes of today's discussion, we're really going to be talking mostly about that, how what what forgiveness looks like in terms of other people. And really, if we were to break that down, there's giving forgiveness and receiving forgiveness. And those are two different processes that have a lot of barriers that we can address as well. There's the forgiveness of self which is really an internal process that follows a similar perspective and outline, but can take many more iterations and can be a little bit more convoluted because as we know, our relationship with ourself is often the most complex. And then, and I'm noticing as I'm presenting that somehow the actual image is not showing up. So this is gonna blur a little bit, but it says preemptive forgiveness, which essentially means building a foundation to make forgiveness more accessible in our future. As I said in the beginning of our presentation, there is so much that we could cover on this topic, so we can't get into all three of these. And there are more resources I can give you at the end to spend more time in each of these. The goal really in the process of forgiveness as a whole is the same. It's just how we engage with each of these. Oh, Kira, I think you muted yourself again. You're keeping me on my toes. <laughs> it's okay. No, I don't know why it keeps doing it in the actual presentation. Sorry, y'all. Technology, we can't fully make sense of exactly why it's all happening, but it's happening. All right, so let's get back to this. Benefits. I guess since we're paused, Maddie, any questions that came up before I go into benefits? No questions yet. So. Okay, awesome. So I mentioned this first one. Again, one of the main things that we do in terms of the forgiveness process is we untether ourselves from painful experiences. Now, I like to think about this in terms of writing our own story. And that's a big thing that I talk about in the work that I do is empowering ourselves or getting the sense of self-efficacy, the confidence to write our own story. By going through the forgiveness process, we give ourselves the best opportunity to do that rather than giving the pen to our pain. Because when we do that, then all of our future experiences, it's like we're on chapter seven, eight, nine in our story, but we keep getting pulled back to chapter two. We keep having to talk about this painful piece or the filter through which chapter seven, eight, and nine happens is all through the lens of chapter two. 
So one of the second and most important benefits is also that we've seen through decades of research that forgiveness is actually correlated and has one of the most important characteristics of long-term relationships. Now, remember when I said that forgiveness is not synonymous with justice, sometimes when something happens, the justice part is that a relationship ends. That doesn't always mean that that's what we need to have happen, though. Sometimes we want to figure out how to move forward. And to be human means we're going to screw up. We're going to get hurt. We're going to hurt other people, intentional, unintentional. So forgiveness is really important in terms of building a foundation for long-term relationships, especially when you think about the longer that we spend with somebody, the more likely we're going to have opportunities to fail so we can flail and learn and grow stronger in the future. And then lastly, it is shown that forgiveness, when we can truly forgive, reduces negative emotions. This is something that came from, I believe it was 2010. I'll have to double check, but there was some research that came out in the like early 2000s, right around the 2010 time, that they actually looked at how forgiveness affects the brain and shows reactivity in the brain around these experiences. And we can see once people go through the true forgiveness process, there's a decrease in anger, in resentment, in PTSD symptoms, so really trauma-related symptoms, if we go through the process there, rumination, which basically means getting stuck on or kind of belaboring thoughts around an experience, and anxiety. So that's a pretty powerful thing too, since most of us really want to get out of those head spaces and not feel like we're stuck there as well. And then before we go through what the process actually is and what these steps are, I want to talk about some of the barriers that make it difficult to access that. And this is really important because, again, misconceptions about forgiveness are a big issue, which ironically is going to be slide one here. The inaccurate understanding of what forgiveness is is a major issue. There are also a few other barriers that make forgiveness difficult to access. And it's important to really make space and to understand that so we can be graceful with ourselves if this feels harder to do than we think it should be. So one of the other issues is if we feel like we're being pushed to do it and it's not of our own volition or choice. So this can happen if it feels like you know, when we're young and maybe a teacher, a caregiver, someone is telling us that we should forgive and move on. It can happen if we feel maybe motivated by external approval and a lot of other people feeling like it's not that big of a deal or just get over it and move on. It can also happen if we feel like it's expected and there's something about our own safety or value being tied to that. So, for example, in a workplace setting, if we don't forgive a coworker or maybe a supervisor and just kind of move on and let go, does that jeopardize our feelings of safety? Kind of tied to this, but separate is timing. So what I find is that it's really when we kind of go back to that grieving and the healing process, there's a really delicate balance between how much time we stay in the grieving part and how much time it takes to get to healing. So if we stay in grief too long, that can be problematic. But if we rush to the healing process without properly grieving, that's also a really difficult place too. So the balance and the intricacies of understanding timing are really important. And to be realistic, what that usually looks like is jumping back and forth a little bit. So thinking we're ready, coming back and saying, maybe we weren't spending some more time there, thinking we're ready, maybe coming back and we weren't. And that's why a lot of times having someone like a therapist or a coach help you to kind of push and pull back when we need to can be really helpful because most oftentimes when we're in our own journey to this, it can feel pretty overwhelming. And then the last and most significant barrier is shame. Now, if we were going to talk about shame fully, what it is, why it's a problem, this would be like seven, eight hours of discussion. Shame was one of the biggest things that I talk about in my work. And I quite literally have a training that is a 10 hour long training on understanding and working through shame. But just for the purposes of today, shame is essentially the threat to connection and belonging. At our core, we need connection to survive and thrive in life. And so our fear of being abandoned, our fear of isolation, our fear of being othered, of being judged, oftentimes is one of the most difficult things in terms of us engaging in the forgiveness process fully, either because it can force us to forgive before we're ready, which means we're just kind of, again, smoothing things over, or sweeping things under the rug, or what it does is it makes us feel like the only way that we can maintain connection is to have power by not forgiving, 
or to hold a grudge because that's what other people want us to do. And so it can become sort of a way of colluding with connection that keeps us stuck in our pain and makes our existence really difficult to, I guess, exist in for lack of a better word. Okay, I wanna walk through some of the steps. Before I do that, what questions does anybody have? Feel free to dump them in the chat or Maddie, if anything has come up, anything you wanna add in now? If there was one uh, question, but yeah. I think you might have already answered it, but just in case you didn't answer it fully, I want to still voice it. Mm -hmm. but how do you move from being ready to forgive? Um, how do you move? How do we move to being ready to forgive? I want to get out of the pain stage. Yeah. So actually, I, I Yes, I maybe addressed it a little bit. I really haven't yet in a way that would really give you a good response. So we're going to hit that when we talk about the steps so that you can really think about that. The short answer is that it's difficult to know when we're ready to come out of grief and when we're ready to come out of that pain, because sometimes we also get really comfortable here. It's oftentimes what I kind of think of as like the predictable crappiness of existence. We exist in our state. We don't love it. We don't like everything that's going on, but it's comfortable. And unfortunately, sometimes pain and negative emotions just become comfortable. We know how to do it. So stepping into forgiveness and letting go of that and thinking, well, what do I do if I'm past this? Maybe this experience has been a way of, again, gaining power. Maybe this experience is something that you've has a, played a big role in your narrative. It can feel like we lose a part of ourselves. So it's almost a complex grieving of not only grieving what happened to us, but now grieving the loss of holding on to that memory. But I'm gonna go deeper in just a few slides on that. Was there anything else, Maddie, before I jump into that and kind of answer that one more specifically? Nope, that was the um, only question so far. Okay, great. So let's talk about that that a bit more in terms of what are the steps to forgiveness. So there are four phases to the forgiveness process. Each one of them, again, timing is really important. What it's going to look like for you to move through these processes, I can't tell you. It'd be ideal if I could say you spend one week here, six weeks here, two weeks here, and then you're totally ready for phase four and you move on. In reality, it's going to be a very personal experience. And oftentimes we can go to phase one, phase two, back to phase one, into phase three. And so there can be some jumping as well. But the first part is really to uncover your feelings and assess the situation. If you think about this, this is really the grieving process in its greatest depth. So what that means is you start to tell the story. We'll use the forgiveness of others as an example, because again, I think sometimes that can be easier to think about. So let's say that somebody did something wrong. Somebody did something really difficult. For example, I have a pretty complex relationship with some people in my family. And there have been things that have happened in my life that have been really hurtful and harmful. And so oftentimes. Oh, Kira, you muted again. <laughs> Can you hear me now? I sure can. I think we're going to have to work through the forgiveness process on this whole <laughs> thing here because I'm I'm feeling it rise up, right? So in reality, what I see about this, this is kind of a side note, but as we're getting reset back up in here, the other day I said that I was setting an intention for the day to be able to just roll with whatever happened. And then I felt like the day gave me every invitation to negate that and to say, you know, screw it, we're done with that. And I just had to keep rolling with things not going the way you want. And I think this is another example of just being in the moment and just saying to yourself, thank you for giving me the opportunity to continue to just be humbled. So phase one, uncovering your feelings and assessing. So coming back to what I was saying, essentially, this is where the grief starts to happen. So what you do here is you go back and you think about what happened. So again, I started to talk about my family and situations that were coming up. So I had an experience when I was maybe in my 20, like early 20s to mid 20s, where I had a family member who said something really terrible to me. I was ending a romantic relationship and starting a different relationship. And somebody made some pretty for lack of a better word, crappy comments to me about myself and some judgments and kind of, I think, projected their own things onto me. 
And this was a relationship that was really important to me. And it felt really sad that they were viewing me and talking to me this way. It was really hurtful. And so to be able to go back and process and kind of uncover these feelings is something that I had to go back and talk through. What's this narrative? What happened? What did they say? What did they do? And answer the questions. Why does it bother me? What about this is hurting me? Is it truly because a lot of us jump to anger? We feel angry. We feel wrong. In reality, anger is oftentimes not the part that's as problematic. It's that we feel hurt. We feel sad. Maybe what somebody said perpetuates a belief we have about ourselves or just makes us feel unworthy. It makes us feel like, what's the point? And that can feel like a really isolating and lonely and difficult place to come out of. So the uncovering process is not just, well, this is my reaction. This is what I feel. It's going, what's under that? Yeah, you're angry. You have a right to feel angry. You were wronged. And what's under the anger? Do you feel sad? Do you feel let down? Do you feel like being vulnerable with something that was really hard for you and then you were vulnerable and then somebody took advantage of that and that sucks? And then the assessment part is to think about what's yours to own and what's not yours to take on. What is, again, kind of coming back to even the justice part, Justice doesn't have to happen by you. Where do you let go of some of that piece? Where can we let go of maybe what that person did and say that what somebody did hurt us, that doesn't have to define us. Or in some ways, even that doesn't define that other person. So for example, even little things come up sometimes. I remember I had essentially, I think the first few months of being a parent, anybody that has ever had a, a young baby in your house and has had sleep deprivation, I'm sure you can agree you're not always your best self when you're sleep deprived and when you have a newborn and there's no pamphlet on that. Um, and so there are times that my husband and I, I think we're not always the nicest people to each other. And I have definitely, I would said a lot of things that I wish I could take back. And so the assessment too in those moments is to come back in my husband's case and say, how much of that was about me? How much of that is really something I want to take on in my story? And how much of that was that I was a convenient person in Kira's story in that time? So maybe me being upset and me saying something mean to him had nothing to do with him. So in this- Kira, you um, froze again, or not froze, you muted. So it's really about getting to the point where you are uncovering your feelings, again, like I said, and then being able to sit with them. Part two bleeds into phase one. So part two is then you sit with all of these experiences. You get an emotional and a cognitive understanding of all of it. And again, what is and is not your responsibility. And then you choose forgiveness. I would say this is one of the phases that people get stalled at because Choosing forgiveness often means letting go of the pain in that moment. So again, choosing to forgive someone means saying that they are more important as a person than what they did, or I don't need to invest so much in what they did, what they said, what happened. It becomes about the choice that you're making, again, to move on in your story. And sometimes I think what's really important here too is to think about if I don't choose forgiveness, if I don't untether myself from this pain, and that pain keeps writing my story, who am I now because of that? How am I going to keep showing up in my life? And do I like that person? Can I be different? Can I be a different person if I let go of this pain? And I think one of the key points here and where this part tends to take some time is choosing forgiveness also means disentangling the belief that forgiveness then is saying that we are, again, that power piece. And so you have to get to the point where you believe that your worth and value is important and supersedes whatever happened and holding that power because of that. So we can say, I deserve to be treated differently than I was. I didn't deserve for that to happen, or that was not okay that that happened to me. And I don't have to hold on to that or hold ill will towards this other person because it happened. I can choose to show up in a different way and let that go. Phase three then is where the work happens. So again, phase one, you're sitting with, you're really in your grief. Phase two is the turning point. Yeah, this was terrible. This sucked. I didn't like any of this. And I can accept that this happened. I cannot change that this happened, but I can change how I choose to move forward given that this happened. Phase three then is where we do the work. 
So phase three oftentimes is where I would say people start to feel the progress happening. They start to see the distancing from or the untethering start to occur. So we start to write the story a little bit different. So rather than, well, this was done to me, this person did something terrible, or even in the case of our own self, I did this bad thing, I did something wrong, I hurt somebody, and we say, this thing happened. My intention or maybe their intention wasn't to hurt me, or even if it was, that doesn't mean that I have to hold on to that. And we're able to kind of almost like package our pain, put it in a box and send it off into the world. And then what I really love in all of the training I've had on forgiveness is because. Kira, you muted yourself again. So there is this gift then of what forgiveness is. And there is this idea then of, well, we're losing. Where are we? 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 Kira, you muted, you got, oh my goodness, you are muted again, I cannot. So when this happens, I'm gonna, sorry everyone, I know it feels a little disjumbled. None of us are doing anything, right? We have to forgive technology. It's amazing and it sucks sometimes. So doing this part, what we're saying is we're gifting ourselves with the opportunity to move forward. We're also putting the gift into the world to let other people know that they have permission to let go of pain, that they have permission to move forward. One of the things that I thought was really interesting about this is when I was actually taking a course at Madison from Dr. Enright, who's a world-renowned forgiveness researcher, is that he, I had about six months prior, I can't remember exactly, I had lost my cousin. My cousin was murdered. And there was a lot that I had that I was, I think, holding on to that I wasn't totally aware of. And we got into some really great debates in the class about, well, can I ever forgive or give the, this gift to somebody who wronged me in such a way? And when he talked about this gift and he talked about giving this gift in the world, he said, you're really giving this gift to yourself to say that this really terrible thing happened but I don't want to be defined by this terrible thing. I want to be defined by who I can be and show up in spite of or because of this terrible thing. And I also have to have the belief that someone else, again, the justice part is separate from me and I can give this gift to them and to other people so that the work that they're doing is their own process, not because of or tied to me and to let other people know that they can do this work and to let go of and live their best life. And then the last phase is the discover and release phase. And really here, it's about kind of moving into this state of understanding wrongdoing is inevitable. Again, we're going to screw up. Other people are going to screw up. And the way that we continue to feel connected to ourselves and to others is to go through that rupture and repair process. If we don't rupture, we can't build strength in the repair. And without that, we just kind of have these loose bonds and connections. So going through this and choosing to show up and to still be committed to our relationship with ourself, our relationship with other people, builds that stronger sense of self. It promotes the, the idea of growing, of evolving, of continuing to be the best person we can be and to see that we are more than one thing that we've done or more than a collection of wrongdoings, that we can actually do other things and grow from that. Now, I mentioned that the self-forgiveness process is the same, really, and so is preemptive forgiveness. With the self-forgiveness process, because it is a bit more rooted in our shame and in our stories, and likely we are really good of, at cataloging everything we've ever done. So when you go back to that grieving and healing, we kind of have this one giant, I don't know why I'm picturing stranger things and like the weird... I don't know, monster thing that it was, but it's kind of this like tons of offshoots of this one painful thing. There's a lot more iterations of these different phases because we have to go through and kind of dismantle our shame in a more complex way. And it's doable. And then we can move to a place where we can give ourselves grace in the future to when I do hurt someone again, because that happens, doesn't make me a bad person. It means sometimes I do things that hurt other people. I can show up with a little bit more understanding and self-love and also see how I want to respond in those moments. So this was a lot of information I just threw at you. I want to give you a couple steps of, okay, so what can I do right now? You're telling me this is a way more involved process. What do I do right now? So the invitation I want to give to you in this moment 
is to ask yourself, spend some time and ask yourself, what are you holding on to? There's a reason you came into this presentation. You want to learn how to forgive. Maybe that's yourself. Maybe that's others. Maybe it's both. Maybe you want to learn how to be more forgiving in the future. Why are you here and what are you holding on to? What are those feelings? What is the, the wrongdoing or the situation or the trigger? Is it a certain person that you're holding a lot of energy towards? And give yourself the opportunity to feel all of that fully. Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you hurt? Are you upset at the world right now for everything that is going on? Are you angry about not being able to see family? Do you feel upset about something that happened six years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago that you're still stuck in? Where are you? And then ask yourself how holding on to this serves you. Be neutral about it. Does it does it do anything for you? Good, bad, or neutral? And who are you if you keep holding on to it? If you keep holding on to what this person did or what you did or how somebody showed up in the world, how does that change the way that you write your story? And now project yourself forward a few chapters and say, am I okay with that? Do I like that? Do I like that person? and my character. If not, okay, we're ready to look at the forgiveness process. If you're all good with it, give yourself permission to let it go and either say I'm not ready for this process or this doesn't feel like something that I want to work on right now. And then I like to kind of summarize that in my head as I get there of holding on to blank does blank for me. Choosing to hold on to blank moving forward helps me how. And the point of saying choice is really important because again, choosing to forgive is our right. We get to choose it. Choosing not to forgive is also then something that is ours to own. So choosing to hold on to something, we can't stop the wrongdoing. People do terrible, horrible things. We have done terrible, horrible things. The world is filled with that. Our choice in the matter is, again, how we integrate it into our story. And so we have to be able to then, with that freedom, take the responsibility of saying, once I get clear on how this does or doesn't serve me, whatever choice I make right now is my choice, and I'm going to be okay with that. And if you're not ready for forgiveness, for forgiveness, that's totally okay. I am just now starting to work on stuff that happened to me when I was about 10 or 11 years old. I wasn't ready until now, and that's okay. There are things that happened a year ago or even things that happened this morning I'm way more ready to work through. It's not all a one and done thing. And then the last part I would say is if you don't do anything that I just said, you're not ready to do any of it, is to hold on to this idea of radical acceptance. What that means is things happen that are outside of your control. People have hurt you, you couldn't control it. You've hurt people, most likely you couldn't control it. Or at least now you can't control it because you can't take it away. So give yourself permission to move on and move forward from that. And ultimately, our capacity to forgive connects with our capacity to be vulnerable. So we have to be willing to be seen and to be heard and to show ourselves fully in order to forgive. There is power in that. Sharing ourselves has more power than hiding ourselves because all that does is isolates us. And without connection, and without showing our true self, we can't actually figure out how to move forward. And then I always tell people that there's no right answer. Should you forgive? Up to you. Should you not forgive? Up to you. And so I want to close before I share some resources with some story time. I was going to bring the book out. To be fair, I'm a little bit worried that if I even show the book or try something else, I'm going to freeze or mute or something else is going to happen. So I'm just going to tell you the story paraphrasing and then put a little plug in to the Stillwater series. So any of you that have kids, young kids, even if you don't, this book series is amazing. It's called Stillwater and there's actually a new show on Apple TV that's based off of it. And it's all about this panda who's called Stillwater and the art of mindfulness and being present in our day. Well, we bought this for our daughter and we were reading a story the other day and it was all about this little boy who was hanging out with Stillwater, the next door neighbor. And he was mad. His brother had said something to him and he was just really irritated with him. And he was carrying this anger all day long, kept talking about it to Stillwater. One of Stillwater's things is that he tells stories. It's kind of the way that lessons are introduced. And he starts talking about these two people. It was two monks, and I forget exactly who this person was, but there was a person who was standing and trying to cross over this puddle. 
and had all this baggage, all this stuff and was kind of, I think in the story, kind of this like higher than thou sort of persona. And one of the monks walked past, just kind of noticed and was like, oh, I don't have time for that. And this person was kind of expecting other people to take care of them. The other monk, who's an older monk, decided to pick her up, carry her across the, the area, the puddle, set her down and move on. This person didn't say thank you. This person didn't acknowledge anything. I think actually even in the story made a comment that was kind of a complaint. If I were to relate this to day-to-day -day life, when we used to all be in public with each other, holding the door open and someone doesn't say thank you and that immediate sort of anger or frustration we get. So the two monks are walking and walking and walking and this younger monk says, I can't believe that you did that for her. I can't believe that you, you know, aren't you upset that she didn't even say thank you, she didn't even care. And the monk's response was, I set her down hours ago. This happened hours ago. I'm no longer carrying her, obviously physically and metaphorically. Why are you? And so this idea again is thinking, why do we hold on to and carry these things for so much longer? Because we've told ourselves they do something, but again, I think they only work to perpetuate our shame and make us stay in that suffering and prevent us from living the life that we wanna live. So with that, I wanna let you know, where can you go from here? Again, I gave you a couple steps. I also tell people, give yourself permission to say, we're gonna take a day or a week or a month and just let this sink in. Cause even though it was only 30 minutes, I talked and gave you a lot of information. If you feel like you wanna keep going and go deeper, I just am excited to share that I have a new 12 week course that I'm gonna be doing starting this fall on creating a forgiving relationship in our partnerships. So whether you've been in a long-term relationship, you are currently not partnered, and even if that partnership or that relationship is friendship, it doesn't have to be romantic. It's really thinking about how do we create a foundation for forgiveness in our relationships. And in that, we're gonna work through some of the stuckness that's gotten in the way of that. Secondly, Coming in March, I have an ebook that's going to take you through the entirety of this forgiveness process. So it's going to walk you through everything step by step, including chapters on self forgiveness, preemptive forgiveness. How do we receive forgiveness when our shame is so strong and we feel like we're not able to let it go? So there's a whole bunch coming to you that way in March. And then one of the last things I'm really excited about, but it's filled right now. And so maybe Maddie will be able to tell us a little bit more about kind of what our next steps would be. We do have a four week course that we're starting in February on self love that is currently full. And we are hopeful that we're gonna be able to offer it again in the future. The eBooks on that are gonna be available for people to purchase in February if that's something you wanna go through on your own as well. All in all, I have tons of new things coming out in 2021 that are really all about helping guide you and give you the support to go through this process. The best way to be in the know on everything I'm doing or to just reach out to me about other things is to email me, which uh, Maddie, maybe you can dump this in the comments because I'm not in there right now. It's info at adversityrising.com. So info at adversityrising.com and join my email list. So I actually recently got off of social media. I'm no longer going to be doing anything on Facebook. Well, this is a Facebook Live. And I am no longer posting on Facebook, Instagram, anything else. I'm only going to be connecting through my email list. So if you want to stay in the know of what I'm doing, you want little invitations to challenge yourself, get curious, do the work, sign up for my email list, and you'll get all of these opportunities plus exclusive access to sign up for some of these things before they're released to the public. So I put that link on the bottom here and maybe Maddie, I know I'm asking a lot of you right now, maybe you can also dump that in the comments so people can copy and paste that out as well. So it's just adversityrising.com slash email dash list. Okay, I'm gonna exit out of this presentation, come back into here. Okay, now I can see the mute button too if anything happens and I can unmute myself. Perfect. Anything else that came up, Maddie? I had one question pop up and I yeah. then also will add in the second ask, but I can't type that fast. But your email has been added to the chat. Perfect. Um, but Hannah had a question. How do you keep how do we keep ourselves accountable to these phases and not give up? Yeah. And so, I mean, I think the reality is a lot of times and I'm going to maybe go a little on my soapbox about New Year's resolutions. I think a lot of times we set up I have to do this and it has to look this way. And all of these things have to happen in order for me to go through this process. So someone says, 
I'm going to, I used to work at a gym and I would see this all the time. I'm going to work out every single day and this is gonna happen. I'm gonna get up at five o'clock every morning and I'm gonna do this. Well, oftentimes what we do is that's really a projection of our shame into our goal setting. So rather than saying, what's under that? What's my intention? What do I wanna do by doing these things? We go to what's the action item and we hold ourselves to this like really stringent way of doing it. That happens in the forgiveness process. So it's, I'm gonna work through this process, everything has to happen and I have to keep focusing on it. Sometimes our body and our brain takes us away because we're not ready, because we don't have the energy for it, because there's something deeper that we need to give our space, ourselves space and permission to just explore. So I think the first part of the answer is maybe counter to what you're asking me, which is saying, rather than judge yourself if you're getting pulled away from it, I think just get curious. Hmm. I'm noticing that I'm not investing as much energy in this right now. I wonder why. Is it the context of my life? Things are changing and evolving and things are different. Is it maybe I'm not ready? Maybe there's something more there and I'm avoiding it. And how do I give myself that flexible grace to be present with myself when that's happening? And then the second part of it, you know, really, if it is just I'm having a hard time because I'm fearful and I'm scared and I need somebody to be with me, I really do think a lot of that comes with having somebody to help you feel safe in going through that process because you are going to be the person that's having to counter your fear brain every single day. And when we talk about shame, when we talk about anxiety, when we talk about distress, all of those different emotions and experience activate our fear brain, which means like, this whole part, our prefrontal cort cortex goes offline. So you might be able to say, it's fine. I'm just dealing with this thing that happened, you know, 20 years ago, or it's just forgiving my husband for leaving the toilet seat up or forgiving my partner for not grabbing bananas at the store. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. Why is this problematic? It's because for whatever reason, your fear brain is getting activated and there's something deeper and bigger going on. And so having someone else hold that space for you and give you permission to be there, but helping pull you out, I think can be really helpful. The other thing I would say is then knowing if every time you're trying to move forward, you're getting really agitated and elevated. I think it's a sign that we need to do some distress tolerance building, which means learning how to sit in your distress so it doesn't get so activating. And then once we have those skills, we can start to work through this process. That was a big answer to your question. Tell me if there's anything I missed. And if anyone else has questions, obviously keep adding them in too. I think honestly that answers all the questions. Um, this was fabulous. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, for everyone watching, if you want more information, please reach out to Kira um, or myself and I can get you in touch. And then also um, we have some really fun events coming up. So go to our website, but also um, our website just updated today for all of our Black History Month celebration events coming up. So please awesome. check those out. Um, they are going to be really fun and wonderful. Um, thanks so much. Have a wonderful day.